Hello, everyone. Wow, what a tough act to follow. Now you get the nerdy analyst guy to talk about sales stuff. So I'm really excited about, about this, and I think you will be too. What I'm going to talk through today is really around this new way of selling and just a, a new race that we're going down as a sales team, as a revenue team, go-to-market team, whatever you call it. The way I like to talk about it is comparing two different things. So one is the relay race, and this is the standard thing. Marketing does their thing, hands it off to the BDR, SDR, who does their thing, hands it off to sales, who does theirs. None of them work together per se, but they just keep handing stuff off to each other. And that's kind of the way it works. And then where I think we're going, and I believe we're going, is to more of an adventure race format, where all of these teams are working together looking at the buyer, what they need, and then utilizing all their resources to be able to provide the best possible experience to that buyer as they're going through the buyer's journey. And one question I ask a lot is, if you were a buyer, which approach do you think would give you the best possible experience? And then I turn it around and said, if you were a company and you could do both of these equally well, which one do you think would allow would give you the best possible chance to win a deal? Obviously, I believe it's the relay race, and I'm going to talk through that a little bit. So you've probably all heard the X percent of the way through the buy. The deal is X percent of the way through the buying process before the seller is engaged, right? So think about that for a second. That means seller is completely unaware of the deal. It goes through what we would call in kind of our nomenclature, the discover and evaluate phase. And then they've done their part, kind of wash their hands of it, throw it over to the seller and say, okay, I'm done. Seller, now you take it the rest of the way and they don't talk to marketing anymore and they do everything themselves. Approach that is talked about constantly. Probably not the best approach if you're, if you're receiving, if it's working that way from you as a buyer. And the way that we're seeing it evolving, and it's, this has been years where we've looked at this over and over, is the buyer's journey is not a handoff. It's episodic. You're working through this process as a seller trying to engage at all phases of the buying decision. A buyer may pull you in at the very beginning. They may pull you in at the very end. There's, there's a lot of different areas where you're going to come in. And Vice versa, marketing, especially from a digital standpoint, is going to get pulled in all the way throughout the process, up to and including you do your presentation for them and walk out the door and that buying group sits down and does some research on what you just said. All of those signals are, are important. And the key thing here is the seller will be involved in all of them. So it's not a handoff. It is a collaborative race that you're running together. And if you think of it from the perspective of a buyer, do you think they care about who they talk to in an organization? They're judging you and your company based on your ability to provide the right experience, the information that they need to be able to make the best decision for their company. They don't want to know if it came from marketing or sales or whoever. They just want it in the right way at the right time to be able to make the best decision. So these five areas that I'm going to cover today really talk around some of the evolving things that are happening in the market. One, high-performing sales teams really need to close this productivity gap. I'm going to spend probably more time on this one than any because it's, it's very important. I think it's very important for some of the announcements that are happening today. Next best actions and cadences. Cadences are going to start moving towards it to the point where those things are going to virtually be the same thing. Technology is now starting to enable this to happen. We're going to talk a little bit deeper about that aligned revenue team and how you can get some, you can get real value by working together in that group. We'll take a, a minute and talk through conversation intelligence. Most people don't see CI as a ROI driver. I really believe it is. And if you use it effectively, it should be for your organization. And then finally, we'll talk to the elephant in the room, which is conversation intelligence or, or with generative AI. And what you're going to hear is I, I, I put this down as it's not a revolution yet because the features you're getting today are useful, valuable, would have been revolutionary if we didn't have the hype around generative AI. But what you're seeing today, we want to talk about so you can understand what you should work or what you should expect from your vendors over the coming year and then a little bit into the future. All right, let's jump in. First one, closing the productivity gap. So 
we do a sales activity study with a lot of customers. I think we have over 400 customers we've done it with, 35,000 or more sales rep where we sales reps where we basically ask them just document how you spend your time in the week. And then we break those down into into a matrix where we look at it with the top as you'd expect the top right, the engagement side being the most important. You've probably seen this stat in many different places that sellers spend X amount of time in front of their customers. When we look at it, did you know that that's dropped? The time that a seller spends in front of their customers dropped by 12% since COVID. Shocking for us when we looked at it because we thought only spending 25% of your time in front of the customer was a little bit appalling, but it's dropping. One of the other things that was really interesting when we do this study is look at enablement. That's prepping to meet with your customers. Sellers spend 40% of their time doing that. So think about that for a second. 40% of their time preparing for the customer meetings, 22% engaging. And that's up 9% from, from COVID days. The part that, that's really fascinating for me with this is I've had a I've added a ton of tools to my tool belt, tons of capabilities, given them to my sales reps, and now they're spending more time on enablement. These tools are supposed to help you spend less time on enablement and get the same results. So there's a lot that needs to change and a lot of value that needs to be consumed from those that are purchasing this technology. So you can pull that number down a little bit and push up the engagement number. The other two, the administrative side stuff you want to get rid of, we've seen a drop in that mostly because of travel. People are traveling a little bit less. And on the relationship side, customer, we, we see that one coming back to parity in pre-COVID because the increase that happened there is really due to a lot of the channel conflict that happened. But the big ones are really around enablement and engagement. And I think these are the areas that are being addressed in the biggest way in 2023, and they'll have the biggest impact in terms of benefits to customers in the coming years. So this is something that I put together after looking at the market kind of flummox. So you saw what we talked about before. I'm spending more time preparing for customer meetings less time in front of company, in front of actual customers, a lot of people justify that by saying, well, the customers are more complex, so I need to spend more time preparing. And there's some validity to that. But what I've seen over and over when I talk to customers, look at their tech stack, try to understand why they're getting less value than they should, is this weight that gets put on sellers as they get one tool after another, after another, after another, to the point where they don't even know what to do with all this stuff. So one, one way to fix that, the one way to avoid that is to have that unified view where a seller can go and do everything they need to do. So they don't get burdened by the weight of all of these technologies. And then when you, when you look at that view, it should solve problems. And when you, that it should solve problems that you need to solve for your company. It should be built to, and set up to address a need that you've identified before you bought it. And if you already have those solutions, you want to identify those needs as well. So this gap, the potential that you have with a lot of the tools that have been purchased is significant. And all of you that have tools already have the ability to capture that at no additional cost. It's just a matter of going in, sorting out the technology and really putting it in front of the seller to solve true problems within their business. So little sad to look at this, but also very exciting in the potential that you could generate from what you already have. So let's talk a little bit about how you leverage this technology. I'm gonna to touch on a fairly sensitive topic, fairly sensitive process that everybody does, everybody thinks important, and I don't think it's important um, because, and I'll talk through this. So we talked about the 23% of the time a seller spends in front of a customer. So that's pretty appalling but there's things that can be done. So one of the areas that you're gonna see with technologies like you're about to see with Rhythm or that you've seen with Rhythm is it's going to allow you to do things that you never thought you could do before. So one of the things that it's gonna do, which is foundational to all of this, it's gonna eliminate the need for sellers to enter activities and it should. So if you think about it from the perspective of how companies worked in the past, it's been, I need my seller to enter the activities. They never do that, or they do it in spits, fits and starts. Doesn't really give you anything useful. That's all changing. There should be no need for you to have a seller enter the activity. The seller should just sell. 
They should spend time in front of the customer executing, selling, and engaging. And then the system should capture all of that, analyze it, and, and use it. So eliminating the activity piece does two things. It gives time back, so the seller gets more time to sell, and it gives you a data set that you can then use to eliminate other work. So next thing that you can eliminate, sellers really shouldn't enter opportunities. So if you're doing all of your data capture using your systems, which by the way is a rote task and rote tasks are about to go by way of the dinosaur, why should they be entering opportunities? So if you look at how opportunities are created, what I'll hear from sales leaders, they'll say, that's BS, they have to enter the opportunity, they have to be, they, they need to be accountable to that. And the question I always ask is, how good are they at it? Like how consistent do your sellers actually enter opportunities? And like, oh, they're terrible. They don't, they don't enter them. It's, it's awful. My sales stages are all messed up. Once you have all the activities, you can look at those, understand the best time to enter, open an opportunity and open it at that time and progress the opportunity all the way through as it goes through the deal. Sellers sell. They focus their time on selling. Let the systems take care of the progress of deals where they're going. One thing this will also do, which is really, really exciting, is as the seller executes deals and doesn't have to worry about the activities and the opportunities, the opportunity itself will go from being this awful thing that I'm really trying to manage so I can manage expectations to my manager to a resource that as a seller I go to to get the insights I need to understand what I should do best, what my strategy should be, and how I should proceed. Once I have all this going, I've captured all my activities, now I'm entering opportunities automatically as a company. Now I have more time as a seller, but also I'm able to get better visibility to how deals are progressing. So the next logical step is I don't forecast anymore. Forecasting is out of the seller's hands. They focus on selling, let the company and the system focus on forecasting and you let them go do their work. And what I hear about that is, oh, I can't have them not be forecasting. That would be that would be crazy. How do I motivate them to, to achieve their objectives? And the, the question I ask there is, you probably pay 10% of your total sales for your business to your sales team in compensation to motivate them to go sell. Is that not working? I mean, I would shift the conversation more to that than I would on the forecasting and arbitrary number that sellers aren't really good at to begin with and that you could do a much better job with. So the end result, as you see these, these, these technologies progress, more time for sellers to sell, because they have less admin work. And as a company, you have more accurate data and you're better for your forecasting better win-win for the seller and for the company. So why don't we all do this today? Like th this, this sounds great. I, I really want to do it. Biggest thing is it's a really hard thing to adapt. Think about all the conversations you have had around when if you have implemented a conversation intelligence solution or some of these engagement solutions or had the conversation around activity capture it's oh my gosh this is this is big brother this isn't something that i should be doing reality is you've got to get them over that if you want to realize those benefits and what that means like the key part of that is you've got to change the metrics you're using to to be able to make that decision think about these two metrics as you're going through this 91% of sellers log in to, to their sales technology once a week, and that is considered a revelation, like a win. We, we're seeing this increase, this is great. Are there any sellers that only talk to their customer once a week? All of their customers? No, they, they're talking to customers every day. They're engaging with deals every day. That needs to be reset. That the seller needs to believe and use that tool every day for everything they do. Same thing, HubSpot did another thing where they said the number one thing that I track is CRM usage. Why do you care about CRM usage? In reality, they should just be executing and using these tools and getting value from them. And by getting value from them, they end up, they, they end up using them more. It isn't about, hey, did you log in today? It's about how do I deliver value? So that shift the value when it comes to adoption is what you need to be able to justify why I want to capture your emails, capture your phone calls and do this stuff for you is because I can get you more efficiency and I can make you a better seller because I have insights that you can't see that I can make visible for you if you just let me do this. All right. So what should you measure? 
the, the thing that I look at for that, and we talk about this very often, is yield per rep per hour. So you should be looking at and using your efficiency and effectiveness tools to be able to understand how much that yield is rep, is that, that rep is yielding for the time that they're spending working. The higher that is, the better it is. Sounds fairly simple, but when you strip everything out, that's productivity of a seller. You just need, if they're able to yield more per hour than another seller does, it's not really much better of a metric for that. And that's a great way to make sure that you're getting the productivity you need. And think about by it, it today, you could strip away a lot of the other stuff and give them a ton of capacity to increase that yield and free the seller to be able to give you yields that probably never seen before. Number two, cadences are going to take a step closer. So here's the reason why I think that 89% pre COVID was 73, which is pretty good. But now all the video calls have taken up the, what we've seen is video calls have flipped. So where you used to do in person at 10% or 11%, now you're doing that in video calls. And then the time you used to spend on video calls are now in person. So, or, so it's, it's inverted. And now you have almost 90% of the interactions available to you to be able to analyze and understand how deal works. And that doesn't even include the fact that all the meetings that are set up for those interactions, so you can at least understand what's going on there. So you have data at a level you've never seen before. If, if you go back to the last one, you're capturing it all. So what that allows you to do, especially if you're working as a unified revenue team, take the digital interactions, seller interactions, I talk about fidelity. That's the conversations that are happening. One of the big value points of generative AI is to be able to take an unstructured conversation and turn it into an insight. That's really, really useful. Aggregate those all together, put them onto the opportunity, understand what's happening. And then instead of going through and talking about forecasting, because we can wipe that out, now I'm coaching for deals on deals and I'm helping. I'm finding different ways to be able to enable that seller. So instead of doing a cadence where you're forward looking, say, I'm going to make these five calls, these systems are going to be able to build very specific cadences that you won't think are cadences because they're so dynamic, but they are because they're giving you recommendations that are allowing you to proceed, but they're taking into account all the things that are happening around the deal. So sales leaders, you're going to spend your time coaching, not dealing with forecasting calls and sellers are going to spend their time taking those insights and doing really innovative things, which is what sellers are really, really good at. All right. Next thing, this is talking about revenue alignment. And I want to start by giving you a little bit of data around this. So one thing about opportunities, they are really tough to get. And the weird thing about that is even though they're very tough to get, companies very quickly throw them away. 34% of, of sellers say this is the hardest thing they do. Prospecting for marketing, when they're very much focused on that and they still only get three and a half percent of the deals closed and moved into opportunities. And then sellers, once they get those deals and lose them, having no other place to go, they just close them and, and walk away from them. So when we do pipeline analysis, the number one loss reason is other. Basically, please get these away from me because I need to move on, which kind of makes sense because they can't do much more with that. They got to move on to the next deal. So what we see happening is you've got this opportunity. You've got marketing who owns all the self-guided interactions, sales who owns all the personal interactions and all the conversations that are happening within them, except maybe chat. And then you have these two groups that are working away on their own in their relay race, just trying to hand off something to sales and sales trying to close the business without even realizing all the power of their combined process and what it can do. This is, this is one of the biggest opportunities if you're a seller to be able to get more value by doing no additional work. And it's one of the things for marketing to be able to increase their impact by leveraging their value. So let's talk through a quick example around that. And I'm gonna do that by talking to what we call detours. What this means is these are deals that fall off the waterfall and they fall off in different places, but the it's a deal that, that comes in, falls off and just disappears. So the concept around detours is that a deal never really goes away forever, just goes away from now. If you lose a deal, it's a contract, it's a two-year contract, it's gonna come back. So we've got a, what we call a 5W process. When does it fall off the waterfall? 
That's those are the different detours. And then you use the other four W's to determine what you should do with it. The reason code. Why did it fall off? Where did it go? Who should own it? What should we do with it? So every deal, once it detours, gets picked up and handled and pushed through the waterfall again. So let's take a quick look and see how this how this works. I'm going to use the detour of closed lost opportunities. And in this situation, you worked your butt off, you got to the deal and you lost it to a competitor. Heartbreaking happens to everybody. So if you look at the 5W process, we know the when and the why, right? When is a closed loss, why is because you lost to a competitor. So where things really start to change in this process is the where. So if I'm a seller, I don't have anywhere to put this. I lost it, I'm closing it and I'm moving on but marketing does. So if you hand it off to marketing, marketing can take on the new owner and take, a, take it on as the new owner. And what they can do is they pull it right back into the top of the waterfall. They build a campaign specifically for lost deals that can nurture that for a year and a half. Say this is a two year contract. And then when that deal comes back up, you don't have to pay to go find it again. You already know what's happening. So you go engage that deal on your front foot with all the knowledge you had and all the insights you had from that nurture campaign. And as a buyer, you haven't been trying to sell me, but you've been trying, you've been keeping in touch and engaging. So I know you, so it gives you a much better opportunity. I don't have to pay for that deal. I'm as a seller going in and, and actively engaging with this in a position of advantage that you wouldn't have had if you were trying to figure out where this deal was. And in many cases, you wouldn't even see it. This is just one example of the power of working together with sales and marketing. All right, conversation intelligence. How is this, how, how is this a ROI driver? I'm gonna to talk to you about another area that isn't necessarily an ROI driver in a lot of people's mind, that's enablement. In a lot of cases, it's very hard to understand what the value is with enablement. So typical process, I create content, train the seller on it, and then I kind of accept this. I give them a test, and if they, they have to pass the test, you're ready, it's adopted, and you kind of hope the seller does what they're supposed to do. With CI, I get different things, and you're gonna see this progress significantly over the coming year or two. What you're seeing now is content is being aligned to adoption. So instead of me creating content and a test, I'm going to create content. I'm going to run it through a model and I'm going to build a set, a set of triggers that I put into these calls that are being recorded and video calls that tell me when this situation comes up, did the seller do it? Did the seller do what they were supposed to do? And what's even cooler about having this all together, it's going to tell me whether it actually worked. Just because you think it works doesn't mean it, it works out in the field. So this isn't about sellers and forcing them to do what they want. In reality, you really want them to not listen to you if they don't think it's right, because that enables the next loop. So if you're doing adoption and you think you're right, then you can see if they did it or they didn't do it and train them, continue to train them until they do it. But what you're gonna find if you're watching this is situations where They've said, nah, I don't think this works. I think I can do it better. And you're going to be able to analyze whether that works or not. And guess what? You're going to find very savvy sellers that do it way better than you train it, that you can learn from. And then you move to an evolution loop where now you update the content and you give it back to your sellers so everybody in your organization can level up and do as well as that particular seller does at handling that specific objection, those specific deals. It's a very significant opportunity for you to increase the ROI of every deal that you're working on by seeing what works and what doesn't and pushing it back through your organization. All right, final part to discuss, generative AI. This is the one that, that everyone's talking about and for really, really good reasons. But what I would say is today, you really need to focus on three things. A lot of this stuff is going to come in the future, which is really exciting. But you as a user going, oh, my gosh, this is everywhere. I need to figure out what I'm doing with this. How do I deal with it? Focus on getting these three things implemented and understanding where they're going. So first thing, summarization. That sounds really nerdy and, and not that exciting. But the reality is if you were doing summarization before, that was an anomaly for, say, a conversation intelligence where you take a transcript and summarize it. 
Today, the minute GPT came out and these models came out, this was commoditized immediately. Not only the summarization, but the ability to summarize and do actions. That is now commoditized, very easy to do. I just run it through the model and, and design it to give me the response or the summarization at the level that I want. So you should be getting summaries of everything in the way that you want it. Um, that That's going to be a very big thing. You're already, I'm seeing this come out constantly with a lot of the different vendors. Next thing, and this is what, what GPT and generative AI tools are all known for is just the ability to put a couple pair of couple bullets in and be able to create a response that's very well written and addresses the points that you're talking about. So a lot of people talk about this, like, oh my gosh, this is going to increase spam. It's going to do all sorts of stuff. And maybe in some other pathways, it would do that. What it, what I think it's going to really do is it's going to have, it's going to up the game on what your buyers are going to expect from you in response. If you send a really crappy email, that's poorly written, that doesn't address the topics you are not, you are going to stand out for the wrong reasons. Use these tools to be, you can use these tools to be able to get really high quality in less time than you would before. Think about the summarization piece. Now, after a call, I don't have to write out the whole follow-up. I just take the summary that was created from the call push it over into an email where it'll give the summarization, type a couple things in, and I'm off, off and running. I don't have to spend all that time doing that anymore. And then the final piece that's really exciting is just getting insights. Today, you're asking this gigantic model for insights that are fairly generic. So it does funny things, or it gives you really nice insights, similar to the way you do a search on the internet. That's cool. That's going to give you some stuff. It's a great way to prompt you and help you as you're trying to write or help you as you're trying to get ideas. But the real value is coming in the in the years to come. You're going to probably see generative AI fade a little bit, but it'll be ingrained in all of the tools and you'll start seeing a significant increase in the value of the insights that are coming through because all of these companies are now looking at ways to connect your data, their data in ways that they can derive insights that are specific to your company, your industry, your use case, the person you're talking to. So that's really what's going to be the biggest value as you go forward. All right. That's what I have for you guys today. But before I go, I want to just talk about three key challenges when it comes to generative AI. One, you're going to see the move from specific to general, which I talked about. The other one, and this one's really interesting. The boundaries between human and AI are going to change. And that you shouldn't be scared of that, but you also shouldn't fight it. There are things that a AI prompt will do better than you. And it's actually going to be all the stuff you hate. All the road tasks, all of that type of stuff is about to be made systematic. And it's going to require you to be strategic. Your strategic success is going to be what's necessary in companies in the future. And then the final piece is, is the like thing to look out for is the, the biggest unknown is how is this going to manage itself from a regulatory standpoint? There's nothing you could do about it, but you've got to keep an eye on it because if you go too deep in certain areas and in, in, it could put you in a bad position, but it could also change the way your systems work very, very quickly. That's what I have for you. Thank you guys very much.